All right. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AFI Presidential Address Session. If you're new to our organization, AFI is the Association for Evolutionary Economics, a group that has served as a meeting place for institutional economists since the 1960s. I'm Charles Whalen, one of the past presidents of the association. I see that there are many others here. I see some faces right here uh, of, who are former presidents. Today, it's my privilege to introduce our president and our featured speaker, John Watkins. Before we begin, I'd just like to cover the procedural matters real quickly. Uh, first, please be sure that your microphone is off during the address. And when John is finished, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your virtual hand and John will call on you. You could also, I, I think, write some questions in the, in the question or comment area. If you can, John will manage to juggle both the oral and written questions and, and take it from there. With those procedural details covered, let's get started. John and I joined AFI in the 1980s. For both of us, among our earliest economics conferences were the snowy Chicago AFI meeting in December 1987. If you were there, you may recall the Palmer House, I think was our home base, and the more laid back Portland AFIT meeting of April 1990. I imagine Chicago's wintry weather in 1987 was quite a contrast from John's undergraduate days at the University of Florida which is where he majored in political science. But of course, John didn't stay in sunny Florida. Instead, he earned his PhD in economics at the University of Utah and has been teaching at Westminster College in Salt Lake City since 1983, where his teaching and scholarship focus on the history of economic thought, evolutionary economics and institutional change, and developments in consumer credit and capitalism in general. John has a deep commitment to teaching economics. In addition to Westminster College, he's taught at the University of Utah and at universities in Thailand and Vietnam. And of course, John approaches economics as an interpretive science, grounded in culture, history, and real world problem solving. In fact, the title of his ambitious introductory text is An Introduction to Economics as an Interpretive Science, Mainstream and Heterodox Views. John's textbook, which runs about 150 pages, offers a clear and concise introduction to economics, not only to essential mainstream economic concepts, but also to the origin and development of capitalism, again, only 150 pages, um, to history of economic thought and contemporary issues, including uh, crucial ones such as macroeconomic instability and the challenge of achieving economic sustainability in the face of global warming. From John's perspective, Smith, Marx, Keynes, and Veblen all deserve attention in introductory economics, which as we all know is worlds away from the view of professors who present economics as nothing more than choice theory, which is the way uh, economics was taught to me in one of my very first economics courses. John's scholarship is of course grounded in the same approach to economics as, as his teaching. Last year, he contributed an AFI paper on the policy response of the current pandemic. And throughout his career, John has built on the work of heterodox scholars, including Veblen and Commons and Minsky to examine consumer behavior, financialization, corporate power, and more. One especially noteworthy article is John's 2019 JEI piece, The Last Gap of Neo Gasp of Neoliberalism, which was written with James Seidelman. It describes the recent and alas ongoing trend in the US toward fascism, which they know was warned about by some of our heterodox predecessors, including Polanyi and Veblen. Both John's teaching and scholarship emphasize the importance of stories in economics. John argues that stories provide a mapping between theory and reality. Thus, they're essential for understanding real world economic life and its problems. For example, John's 2018 JEI article, JE article, The Stories That Economists Tell, shows that the work of Minsky and the Institutionalist has a much more compelling story to offer than the economic mainstream on consumer behavior and financial crises. As a result, John argues, it's the heterodox tradition, not the mainstream, that advances our efforts to understand and improve 
economic processes. Finally, there's John's professional service, which is as extensive as his contributions and his scholarship. For example, in addition to serving on the board of AFI and AFIT as a chair of various AFI and AFIT committees, he served as president in 2014 of AFIT and now is wrapping up his service as AFI president. But before that presidential term ends, John has one more responsibility of that office to discharge, which is to deliver his AFI presidential address, the origins and evolution of consumer capitalism, the paradoxes posed by continuous mass production. And so it gives me great pleasure to pass the virtual microphone to our AFI president and my friend, John Watkins. Charles, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, I much appreciate it. And I, I do want to thank the organization for entrusting me with this responsibility. I think it was a, it was a great honor. And of, of course, it was an ensemble effort. The, um, the chairs and the members of AFI are wonderful in terms of their commitment to the organization. And of course, Eric Haik was, uh, was just infinitely helpful. And I, I much appreciate that. Um, this is uh, that my talk tonight is actually part of a, a much larger project and um, on the, the impact of continuous mass production. So my talk tonight is actually taking selections from um, a book that I'm, I'm close to wrapping up, but it's uh, granted, I of course have not able to, uh, to cover all the paradoxes. The ones I'm focusing on primarily are the business response and the impact uh, on consumers and uh, and society, which, which in itself is, is large. Um, if you'll let me share my screen, if I can. Okay. Um, well, forgive me for disturbing the dust in not so forgotten lumber rooms. I sympathize with R.H. Tawney's comment, which I think is a, a profound reason for the study of the history of economic thought. Tawney wrote, the past reveals to the present what the present is capable of seeing, and the face to which one age is a blank may to another be pregnant with meaning. Continuous mass production technology, widely adopted in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, introduce what J.R. Commons and John Maynard Keynes called the era of abundance. Continuous mass production enabled businesses to vastly increase output, thereby reducing per unit costs, potentially increasing profitability. Thorstein Devlin was among the first to observe the business response, noting that continuous mass production posed a problem how to prevent production from exceeding what the market could profitably absorb, how to prevent losses, how to increase profits. Avoiding excessive production and increasing prices required the adoption of the corporate form of business enterprise, merging corporations to control output and adopting various institutional innovations, particularly the holding company. Merging corporations and controlling prices further involved changing the concept of property itself, changing the laws, freeing corporations to engage in activities beyond the scope of their charter, increasing sales and hence increasing demand further required institutional changes, the establishment of retail outlets in different regions of the country, systematic and rational advertising, financial innovations to extend credit to consumers, and most importantly, a change in culture from emphasizing the virtues of thrift to the pleasures of gratification. Continuous mass production introduced consumer capitalism, applying the technology to consumer goods, creating the necessity of consumer demand to keep pace with the increased production. Expanding both the production and consumption of goods fuels the accumulation of capital creating a continuous feedback loop, a circular causation. Increased production necessitates more consumption, which in turn necessitates more production. Continuous 
mass production accentuated a number of paradox. The prospect of depression, or as Keynes put it, the paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty. The rise of dynastic ambitions channeling the increased output into militarism. Financial innovations involving identifying and liquefying consumer assets to provide consumers credit, expanding demand, and laying the foundation for the financialization of the economy. Financialization culminated in the great financial crisis, requiring massive government intervention on behalf of financial institutions to avoid an economic meltdown. The great financial crisis gave rise to modern monetary theory as a means of dealing with the great financial crisis and particularly the COVID-19 induced recession, overcoming the limits of the market economy and the environmental crisis resulting from the commodification of everything accentuated by applying continuous mass production to the extraction and burning of fossil fuels combined with a belief in infinite growth. Consumer capitalism originated in the late 19th, early 20th century with the creation of a national market and the introduction of continuous mass production technology, initiating what Alfred Chandler called the second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution lacked the foundation in science. It created a chemical industry with no chemistry, an iron industry without metallurgy, power machinery without thermodynamics. As Alfred Chandler noted, in the 1880s and 1890s, new mass production technologies, those of the second industrial revolution, brought a sharp reduction in costs as plants reached minimum efficient scale. In many industries, the throughput of plants at that scale was so high that a small number of them could meet the existing national and even global demand. The economies of scale and scope associated with continuous mass production changed the nature of production itself. Railroads and telegraphs spanned the continent overcoming local markets, establishing the first national market. Farmers could send their wheat, corn, and barley at reduced cost to markets back east, ranchers their cattle. New England millers sent their lumber to the Midwest. Manufacturers sent their goods from the cities on the East Coast westward. The railroads opened to the West to homesteading. To foster the settlement of the West, the government forcibly removed the indigenous peoples from their traditional lands. Advances in transportation and communication initiated a manner of economic development outlined by Adam Smith. By extending the market, the railroads expanded the division of labor thereby increasing productivity and output. The creation of a national market proved propitious for business using continuous mass production. The technology increased the speed with which goods could be produced, providing a cost advantage. The advantage enabled businesses to produce goods previously produced within the home. Attracted by lower prices and easier access consumers began, produce, began purchasing mass produced goods instead of producing household goods. Electrification brought new products in its wake, radios, electric lighting, washing machines, further attracting consumers. Henry Ford introduced the moving assembly line, the classic example of continuous mass production, greatly reducing the price of automobiles. A national market combined with continuous mass production led to a sea change in the institutions of late 19th century, early 20th century capitalism, changes that helped foster the subsequent development of the US economy. First, the modern corporation emerged in response to the need to the manage of the railroads in the 1870s and 1880s. The corporate form with its hierarchical form of management was soon adopted by other businesses, allowing them to combine, combine mass production with mass distribution. Establishing retail outlets enabled corporations to distribute goods at different geographical locations. Second, continuous mass production technology led to cutthroat competition as businesses cut prices to gain market share. Increased production exceeded what the market could profitably absorb precipitating the depression of 1894. Unable to pay for the high 
fixed cost of machinery. Many businesses went into bankruptcy, leading to the merger movement of the 1890s and later in the 1900s. The banks merged the businesses to control output using any number of devices, outright purchase, lease, holding companies, and a representation of, of a minority in the directorate. In many cases, the courts voided the mergers, claiming mergers exceeded the conditions of the charter. Among efforts to restrict output, the most successful was a holding company, an institutional device in which one firm held stock and other firms. While the Sherman Antitrust Act outlawed monopolies, the holding company enabled banks to circumvent the act by purchasing stock in companies to gain control. In some cases, businesses themselves emerged to dominate the industry. South Improvement Corporation, for example, which later became Standard Oil, used economies of scale to undercut the prices of its competitors, forcing them into bankruptcy. Third, changes in business practices spurred on by the merger movement led to change in the definition of property. Holding companies, holding the stock of individual companies, in turn, issued their own stocks, attributing their value to goodwill, the result of prices from restricting output, a point noted by Eric Haig. In the past, businesses were valued based on the cost or replacement cost of their assets. By the late 19th century, property came to mean the discounted present value of an anticipated income stream. The change from property conceived as a physical thing to present value, from use value to exchange value, from corporeal value to intangible property, laid the basis for financing corporations and extending credit to consumers. Consumer credit enabled corporations to circumvent the limited income of consumers, extending consumers credit based on the value of consumer assets. Sales finance company provided installment credit using the goods sold as collateral. The evolution of consumer capitalism reveals efforts to identify consumer assets, liquefy those assets, and encourage consumers to incur debt based on those assets. The fourth strategy involved efforts to increase demand through advertising. Advertising had existed for years, but under corporate influence, advertising agencies appeared undertaking systematic efforts to increase sales by establishing national brands, providing quality assurance to consumers, providing producers a measure of certainty regarding sales. The technology of continuous mass production posed a problem that had not previously existed, the problem of depression. Crises had plagued capitalism from its origins, but living on the farm insulated most people from mass unemployment. Moreover, given limited production, unemployment was not widespread. All that changed with continuous mass production. The movement from farm to factory meant that workers increasingly depended on the factory for their livelihood giving rise to the prospect of mass unemployment. By the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, the increased output from continuous mass production posed a problem, how to absorb the increased output. Thorstein Veblen, Karl Polanyi, and John Maynard Keynes offered different perspectives. For Veblen, the solution lay in differences in culture. In England, the system of conspicuous waste fostered increases in consumption to absorb increases in output. In Germany and Japan, militarism absorbed the increases in output, subsequently manifesting itself in war. Karl Polanyi offered a global explanation. The solution lay in abandoning free trade, attempting to protect human beings and businesses from market forces. And for Keynes, the solution lay in the theory of effective demand. Anticipated by John Hobson, Keynes argued that World War I resulted from the efforts of the European economies to increase their exports, necessitated by the failure of laissez-faire policies at home. The different explanations turn on the problem posed by modern technology, the problem posed by continuous mass production. Simply put, continuous mass production posed a problem that continues today. Who will buy the goods? What kinds of goods will be will be produced, what is the impact of commodifying everything? For Veblen, increased consumption in England served to absorb the increased output. 
the result of the system of conspicuous waste. The system of conspicuous waste refers to a scheme of properties, decencies, and standards of living, the economic motive of which is competitive spending. The system refers to a cultural response to the increased output associated with new technologies introduced in the late 19th century. The response attempts to avoid the disrupting effect of modern technology by resorting to that, quote, fertile domain of conventions and institutional arrangements induced as a secondary consequences of the growth of industrial efficiency and contrived to keep its net serviceability in bounds by diverting its energies to industrially unproductive uses and its output to unproductive consumption, unquote. Veblen introduced the concept to explain the different responses of Germany and England con to continuous mass production in the years before World War I. The concept also helps explain Japan's response to modern technology. The different cultural responses to changes in technology illustrates Veblen's concept of cumulative causation. Technology expands the possible outcomes. Differences in culture, institutions, and habits select for different outcomes, again illustrated by the different responses of England and Germany. The system of conspicuous waste maintains a dominant and pervading influence over consumption since the emergence of the modern corporation in the late 19th century. Corporate efforts to increase sales through advertising, to create, define, and shape the conventions of consumption, and to provide credit based on the identification, creation, and liquefaction of consumer assets represent further developments of the system of conspicuous waste. Quote, with competitive gain as a legitimate end of endeavor comes also competitive spending as its legitimate counterfoil, leading to a ubiquitous system of conspicuous waste, unquote. The importance of the system of conspicuous waste reveals itself in Veblen's comparison of Britain and Germany in the years before World War I, which Veblen explores in Imperial Germany and the Industrial Revolution. As Biddle and Warren Samuels note, the book was an examination of the causes of Germany's emergence as an aggressive and formidable war power. It concerned itself with the broader questions of the causes and consequences of war, questions seldom addressed by economists of his day or since. England, with its history of individualism, free markets, and limited government, gave free expression to the individual, eventually manifesting itself in the system of conspicuous waste. Quote, the dominant note of everyday life was industry and trade, not dynastic politics and war. This national experience gave as its outcome constitutional government and the modern industrial technology together with the animus and the point of view of the modern materialistic science, unquote. In England, the standard of living had been rising since the Industrial Revolution, a standard largely set by the upper classes. In Germany, living standards remain lower than in England. Despite lacking England's cultural habits, the transference of technology nevertheless provided Germany with an advantage. Germany could avoid the cost of developing the technology. England too had borrowed much of its technology, but over a long time period from nations with similar cultures. Being the first to develop machine technology later proved to be a deterrent. England had built its railroads using narrow gauge, which later proved a hindrance as transportation advanced. Germany's purpose was to create a self-sufficient empire using militarism to, to dispose of its surplus and attain its dynastic ambitions. Quote, the combination of the time-honored fanatical loyalty of feudal barbarism with the possession of modern technology made the dynastic state a formidable warlike force indeed. The Polanyi did not explore the institutional changes wrought by the introduction of continuous mass production. He did not address the rise of the corporation, changes in the concept of property, or the emergence of a consumer society. Polanyi focused on the market economy, concentrating on its international dimensions, its origins, and its subsequent demise. He treated imperialism as one sign of the breakdown of the market economy. The market economy arose in response 
to the needs of business to sell goods pouring forth from England's factories. Polanyi treated machine production as an accelerating continuum stemming from the Industrial Revolution. The increased output exceeded what England could profitably absorb. To sell output and to obtain inputs, England adopted a policy of laissez-faire and erected a system of self-equilibrating markets. Selling more output and purchasing more inputs required a market economy. Once established, the market system proceeds without interference. As noted, Polanyi attributed both the origins of the market economy and its subsequently breakdown to the Industrial Revolution. The source of the breakdown, quote, lay more than 100 years back in the social and technological upheaval from which the idea of a self-regulating market system sprang in Western Europe, unquote. The market economy was organized to allow business to profit from machine production. By the late 19th century, however, the increased output stemming from the introduction of continuous mass production spelled the demise of the market economy. The reason is simple enough. To recover the cost of machines using the new technology, businesses needed to sell ever increasing amounts of goods. Free trade proved inadequate. Businesses needed protection found in various forms, imperialism, tariffs, and central banks. Quote, modern central banking in effect was essentially a device developed for the purpose of offering protection without which the market would have destroyed its own children, the business enterprise of all kinds. Eventually, however, it was this form of protection which contributed most immediately to the downfall of the international system, unquote. The domestic economy depended on credit money, the international economy on gold. The central bank served as a buffer against the vagaries of the international economy. Under a gold standard, balance of trade deficits caused an outflow of gold, deflating prices. Quote, by centralizing the supply of credit in the country, it was possible to avoid the wholesale dislocation of business and employment involved in deflation and to organize deflation in such a way as to absorb the shock and spread its burden over the whole country, unquote. Polanyi, <coughs> excuse me, Polanyi relied on the book, The World's Banker, 1870 to 1914 by Herbert Feist for the role that hot finance played in the breakdown of the market economy. Feist's book traces the outward flow of European surplus capital from 1870 until the war of 1914 through 18, caused waste and destruction again to usurp the place of creation and thrift. Feist had hoped his research might provide the basis for a more synthetic understanding of 19th century European civilization, a synthesis later provided by Polanyi. <coughs> Despite Polanyi's argument that the origins of the market economy lay in the Industrial Revolution, it was the introduction of continuous mass production combined with the dynastic ambitions of various states that sealed the fate of Europe. Quote, the motive of hot finance was gain. To attain it, it was necessary to keep in with the governments whose end was power and conquest, unquote. During the latter part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, hot finance acted independently of governments as a sort of supra-institution providing the nexus between the political and economic spheres. While hot finance benefited from regional wars, supplying the credit that financed the purchase of weapons, a generalized war was contrary to their interests. Hot finance provided the private financing for much of the investment of the time that resorted to borrowing both public and, profit, and private. Its motive, of course, was profit. The dominant economic power in the years leading up to World War I was Britain. The goods that poured forth from her factories were exported the world over. The profits that returned to Britain provided the surplus capital to finance foreign investments. Quote, Western Europe, through its spared accumulations of capital, impregnated all other regions with the growing cells of its civilization. The economic and political arrangements of the world were thereby permanently changed, unquote. For the most part, British capital was interested in making loans, preferably short-term. 
quote, British capital favored an economic development that would produce, for the, produce the revenue for debt service or dividends rather than loans to government or government guarantees, unquote. British financiers preferred, preferred private investments to government ventures, investing in foreign industries that would not compete against the home country. In 1915, estimates placed the national income of Britain at 11 billion, of which 16% was saved, half of which was invested elsewhere. France took a different approach. The French had few colonies, denying them the opportunity to invest in familiar enterprises. More than the British, the French used investments to advance their political purposes. The French helped help finance Russia's railroads, 37% were built for military purposes. French creditors assumed borrowers would command sufficient resources to repay their debts. Quote, investment was that of a lender who relies upon the general solvency of the borrower rather than upon the success of the enterprise, unquote. Germany too borrowed to help finance military expenditures. The spark that initiated the collapse was the failure of business to convert goods and services into commodity money, that is, into gold or paper backed by gold. As Carl Polanyi Levitt observes, quote, both Keynes and Polanyi ascribed the principal role to the international monetary order as a transmission mechanism that placed politically unsustainable pressures on countries forced to adjust to the dictates of financial markets in the internal in the interest of Rentier bondholders, unquote. <clears throat> the foundation of its profit was the gold standard. If governments ran deficits, halt finance demanded cuts. It became the enforcer of the rules with the backing of the British government. This, however, introduced an incompatibility between the domestic market and the international market. Satisfying the spending cuts that halt finance demanded helped precipitate depressions. The Great Depression accentuated the paradox of poverty in the midst of plenty. The depression resulted from the failure of the private sector to generate sufficient demand to absorb the increased output, impoverishing millions. The policies and theory underlying classical economics precluded policies necessary to pull the economy out of depression. Classical economics advocated laissez-faire, free trade, and balanced budgets. They argue that government deficits displace private investment, reducing economic growth. <clears throat> in their view, the solution to depression lay in deflation. Continuous mass production, however, increased economic output, outpacing the private sector's ability under existing institutional conditions to purchase that output. In the general theory, Keynes attributed the depression to a collapse in effective demand resulting from a collapse in investment. Some years later, he attributed the failure to recover from the depression to insufficient consumption. <clears throat> as Keynes noted, as Keynes noted, the problem lay in, increase, in an increase in output combined with an institutional structure that discouraged consumer spending. Quote, but the main explanation of what has happened this year in Great Britain and for several years in the United States is, I am certain, the gigantic powers of production far exceeding any previous experience of a modern industrial economy. Coupled with institutional factors which tend to encourage accumulation or retard the growth of consumption when incomes increase, this means an unprecedented output has has to be reached before a state of full employment can be approached. The increased output associated with continuous mass production made cultural change a necessity. <coughs> As Herbert Hoover observed, mass production requires mass consumption. England was slow to increase consumption, a fact that W.W. W. Rostow find perplexing. King's observation made years earlier offers an explanation. The suppression of working class incomes, consciously or unconsciously, provided the rentier the high incomes from which to accumulate their savings. Quote, thus this remarkable system depended 
for its growth on a double bluff or deception on the one hand, the laboring class is accepted from ignorance or powerlessness or were compelled, persuaded or cajoled by custom, convention, authority and the well-established order of society into accepting a situation in which they could call their own very little of the cake that there and nature and the capitalists were cooperating to produce. As noted, Keynes focused on the effect of changes in investment via the multiplier as the primary cause of the depression. Peter Timmon offered a different explanation. The primary cause of the depression was not a collapse in investment, but a collapse in autonomous consumption. There are two reasons for this, overproduction in the construction industry and the stock market crash. The fall in exports further aggravated matters. The data does not support the proposition that the depression resulted from the multiplier effect from a collapse in investment. <coughs> Quote, the decline in income in 1930 lies rather in the combined behavior of consumption and exports. Timmon continues, quote, the large fall in consumption in 1930, therefore, has no satisfactory explanation. It may have been related to the fall of construction since construction tends to move in waves and a decline in this activity may have altered expectations adversely. Clarence Ayers faulted Veblen for not basing his views of depression on effective demand. And while Veblen did not emphasize the importance of demand, he acknowledged its importance. Ayers also faulted Keynes for not including Veblen among the so-called army of heretics who anticipated Keynes' theory. For as Ayers commented, Keynes' theory is Veblenian for both Veblen and Keynes concern themselves with the problem of social provisioning, or as Ayers put it, the community's efforts to feed and clothe and house itself. We have then three different views of the impacts of the introduction of continuous mass production. Devlin's emphasis on differences in culture between England and Germany manifesting itself in war. Polanyi's emphasis on the impact of the industrial revolution first introducing the market economy and later with the introduction of continuous mass production leading to the demise of the market economy. And the ideas of J John Maynard Keynes who while emphasizing the collapse in investment as the cause of depression, later arguing that the prolonged depression resulted from the failure of consumption to absorb the increase in output. If depressions, if the threat of depressions have taught us anything, it is this. First, depression and democracy are incompatible, a point noted by Schumpeter and underscored by the great financial crisis. And second, a market is more than places where buyers and sellers meet. The institutional basis of the market economy lies in the promises we make to each other, promises noted by Commons, Polanyi, Keynes, and Minsky. Those promises are formalized contractually, manifesting themselves in part as financial assets. The idea that one person's asset is another's liability, promises that until very recently, the mainstream ignored by disrupting markets, unemployment, inequality, and pandemics disrupt our ability to fulfill those promises. A modern monetary theory, in effect, offers policies to overcome the limits of the market economy, enabling us to fulfill those promises and more, allowing us to avoid depression. The most pressing paradox However, confronting humankind is the environmental crisis. Capitalism must grow, growth driven by the drive to accumulate capital, propelled by continuous mass production using fossil fuels. The products churning out from factories, first from Britain and the United States, and later from the world, result in an abundance of goods for those who could afford them. The output pouring forth led to a cultural change elevating consumption as a purpose of human existence. Continuous mass production and the drive to accumulate profits has molded our culture, habits, and values. It justifies the enjoyment of some at the expense of others. It feeds profits and satisfies our desire for more, 
all resting on burning fossil fuels, the extraction of which also rests on continuous mass production. We depend on growth to create jobs, provide economic security, and generate revenues for governments. The, affum the affluent accumulate profits, the rest of us accumulate the stuff that the affluent sells. More production requires more consumption, requiring more production. Among the various threats, species extinction, climate change, and the increasing cost of resource extraction, climate change presents the greatest threat. The threat confronts us as a paradox, as the Darwinian dilemma. Darwin presented natural selection in two different forms, the struggle for existence and survival of the fittest. In the struggle for existence, the human species has triumphed. Two canine, quote, two canine animals in a time of dearth may be truly said to struggle with each other, shall get food and live, unquote. We can take comfort in eliminating our predators, subduing many of our pathogens, and securing our food supply. We have outcompeted other species for the available resources. We have removed the checks that historically limited human population. Continuous mass production has bestowed upon us the age of abundance, at least for those who have the wealth and income. For the 44% of the world's population living on $5.50 a day or less, abundance is beyond their grasp. We have entered the Anthropocene, affecting the course of evolution itself. We have become as gods, deciding which species live, which die. The decision rests on which species prove most profitable and, as Veblen pointed out, which species are most servile. Other species avoid our judgment, flourishing on the conditions that we created. Roaches, rats, and coyotes do well in our environments. In terms of survival of the fittest, the verdict remains unclear. Survival of the fittest refers to a single organism trying to survive changes in the environment. Quote, but a plant on the edge of a desert is said to struggle for life against the drought, unquote. And eliminating other species and impeding the services of others, we have made the environment less conducive to our own survival. A four degree Celsius increase in the mean temperature will leave parts of the planet uninhabitable. Around the equator, daytime temperatures will be too high for humans to live. We confront the Darwinian dilemma winning the struggle and in the process, making the earth uninhabitable for us. To wax metaphorically, Gaia has acquired a fever, attempting to throw off the virus that is us. Now, I don't mean to suggest that all is doom and gloom. At numerous times in the past, the future appeared hopeless. The future is always surprising for good or ill. All we can do is extrapolate current trends into the future. Of course, we need to shift the technology of continuous mass production in ways that provide for the needs of many as opposed to the profits for the few. And we need to recognize the importance of the services that nature provides unaccounted for by the market or mainstream economists. We need to transcend the Darwinian dilemma. We need to find ways large and small to address the problems at hand, which is exactly institutionalists are trying to do. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. Are there questions? Or comments? I know you all are well familiar with Veblen and Polanyi and Keynes. So I didn't try to get into the details so much, but did try to offer a different, a different take, a different interpretation. Okay, well, in case, thank you all for, for listening. Oh, Charles.
I just wanted to say, you know, in my introduction, I suggested about the ambitiousness of, of your teaching and some of the research that flows from that teaching. I think we all have seen evidence of that in your presentation and it's really impressive. And, and I just wanna thank you so much. And I'm sure that everyone else feels the same way and they're welcome to speak up, but I did wanna at least say that and uh, express that. And uh, I think it was just terrific and thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, see, I've, I've got you spellbound. <laughs> can I can I ask a question? Of course. Good. Um, one thing that I found missing when you talked about uh, Polanyi and Keynes um, and Veblen uh, was uh, commons and and regulation as a solution to the problem of the large corporation. Uh, you can know, you comment on that and why commons wasn't included? Um, I didn't include commons because I, I didn't want to go too extensively. Um, the other aspect of that, that, um, you know, I'm not well versed in his theory of regulation. I'm, I'm pretty well versed in, in commons issues with regard to um, debt and so forth. But, um, and I, I, I didn't feel that it really, you know, commons, didn't address, to my knowledge, he certainly addressed debt, but he didn't address consumer credit per se. And he didn't address the role of advertising. And he didn't address the effort to stimulate, stimulate demand in that manner. Um, so I, I thought Common's views in terms of that were, were a bit off center from what I was trying to get to. Um, you know, this is an extensive project and I'm, I'm another person that, that I do include and address is, is John Hobson but I didn't think he would be as um, interested to institutional economists. And Hobson and Veblen also um, seem to be talking past each other, even though that they were overlapped over a number of years. Good, thank you. And thank you for the wonderful presentation. Well, thank you for your comments, Steve. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Well, I understand the cocktail party is starting very soon. Unfortunately, it has to be alone, doesn't it? There's a hand up from Lane. Oh, Lane, yes. Yes. Please. Well, I mean, this was just a wonderful talk. I mean, it you 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 know, the absence of economic history in the current curriculum, uh, you've certainly shown <laughs> or, or the relative absence why it shouldn't be that way. Um, what is, what is your plan, what is, uh, uh, the plans for disseminating this? I mean, this is just a, you know, I mean, YouTube, I don't know whether you get 2 million views, but, you know, uh, I, I think this type of thing, heterodox economists have to sort of transmit stuff to ordinary people and students and so forth. Through it. So I guess the question is, what are your plans? Well, I have what a contract. Are you going to publish a book or? I have a contract with Routledge. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm I'm close. You know, it's it's always hard to judge when you're going to finish. I'm always amused by, and I'm sure we all are, by PhD students who anticipate they're going to finish at a certain time. Um, I'm more realistic, but 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 I think I'm getting I'm getting closer. I've got a, quite a number of chapters and going back through and, and editing. And I realize there is much that is not addressed in this. Um, it's simply beyond. Um, but but I did want to, you know, the target audience is uh, is more the educated lay person. Parts of it may be a bit over their head, but clearly the educated lay person. Um, but, but you're right. Uh, well, one of the amazing things in my mind, just, and, and I have a, a chapter on this where I go through, you know, the different theories of, um, of consumer behavior. And it is just absolutely shocking. Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, Chamberlain and John Robinson's, John Robinson dealing with advertising simply was in terms of the cost curves. Uh, Edward Chamberlain recognized the possibility of influencing demand and he cites Veblen, but he didn't develop it. 
And of course, if you look at, at the um, permanent income hypothesis or even Duesenberry's um, um, the dependence, or, or excuse me, Duesenberry's hypothesis, um, you know, the, basically they view advertising as providing information to consumers, Lancasters, for example, hedonic prices. He says that there are novel goods, but the, um, but the characteristics of those goods already existed. And I, I think it's ridiculous because I'm thinking of the Kung Bushmen. I don't think they anticipated, for example, the characteristics of television or many of the modern conveniences. Um, but it is astounding to me that the mainstream just has ignored uh, the role of credit largely in advertising. Um, but be that as it may. Can I say one thing more? You know, it, it um, you've really give us, given us a, a sweep of things like pull on your web one. And that's, what, I mean, that's, I think, what, what, one of the things we all loved about this presentation. Certainly I did. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I did want to, you know, the idea of the continuous mass production, which certainly other people had, as, as noted, had hit on that. And Chandler, there was a, a, a person who first coined the term, Stanley Jevons, not to be confused with the marginalist revolution, coined that back in the 1930s, emphasizing the application of science and so forth. Um, but it, it, it is, it's surprising how mainstream economics ignores this. And I did, of course, look pretty extensively at Robert Gordon's uh, book on, um, on the rise of the consumer, but he's simply focusing on the products. He's not focusing on the institutional changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and his model for that, uh, Robert Gordon's model for that is Solo's growth model. Um, any other comments or questions? Hi, John. Uh, I, I, I usually, uh, I, I really appreciated the talk. Uh, very, very stimulating. Uh, I think uh, it's the only time I've ever heard my name during a presidential address. So I uh, appreciate uh, recognizing where some of that relationship is. But uh, uh, <clears throat> I read your article, I, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I, I, usually, um, I usually go to Veblen for one thing and, and Polanyi for another. So I enjoyed uh, the the fact that you were making a connection. I as I, as I understood it, uh, in terms of um, what Polanyi was describing in terms of the role of the rentier and uh, the financial interests. Um, could it be that? Uh, but I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen many other people that have explored some of the connection there in terms of how Polanyi was. Um, how you could see it as, as being related to what Veblen said about finance. So I don't know if you've found many other people that have done that or, and I, and I wonder maybe Polanyi was not as explicit about it if he was writing at a later time when that Veblenian change was already sort of fully implemented. I don't know. Yeah, I, I haven't found, Veb, or excuse me, Polanyi, any references of Polanyi to Veblen. <laughs> and probably because he was coming, you know, coming out of Eastern Europe. And when he was writing the Great Transformation, and starting in in England, um, I'm sure I'm sure under the conditions of World War II and and the and the hectic uh, pace that he was he was writing, um, you know, he didn't address that. He did address um, in in one of the passages he had that I that I quoted there that uh, businesses found that you know that because of their large fixed costs that they had to earn a certain sufficient revenues. And that was from uh, a Chapman. So he had a three volume history of England. And the third chapter was on uh, beginning with the 1870s to like the early, early 20th century. So it seemed to me very clearly, even though the Polanyi, I couldn't find where Polanyi conceded the dramatic increase in output, it seems pretty clear to me, both in terms of his reliance on Feist and Chapman, um, and they're both dealing with the very late 19th, early 20th century. Okay. That the, that the backdrop that for the demise of the market economy was really under the influence of the, um, the second industrial revolution. But Polanyi doesn't address it explicitly. Yeah. And, that, and that, I haven't found anybody who's, who's made an effort to, to address that. Yeah, well, that's, uh, uh, thank you for your talk because I think you did. Well, thank you very much.
anybody else. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your time. Um, much, much appreciated. And, um, and I look forward to, uh, to the other sessions and, uh, and hopefully seeing you all in person next year. So I think, I think AFI is a great organization and we're, we're doing, all doing important things. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows how the world will turn out, but you've got to keep trying. So thank you all. Stay safe. And I will see you all later. Take care. Take care.